Hello, Shamoy, Bloyden there with uh, Happy New Year. Welcome back to Wales in the Movies and Cymru Views. Once again, after a delay, slightly longer than expected. In this episode, I'm analysing a movie from 1940 that's important for Wales for reasons of politics, history, culture, and also aesthetics. It stars Paul Robeson, Rachel Thomas, and Edward Chapman. In the USA, it was known as The Tunnel. Here, across the pond, it was simply called Proud Valley. Mum, I tell you, he's got a bottom bass like an organ. The finest I ever heard in these valleys. Hey, was that you? Yeah, but I got to find a job. That's why I'm on my way to Darren Valley. This fellow brought a black man to work on the pit. Now you tell your mother from me that unless she pays me something next week, it's in the county court I'll be putting her. If I went to London and met those owners face to face, do you think that would do anything? You chaps are Welshmen and you can sing. What's wrong with singing our way to London? The Proud Valley premiered in the UK on the 6th of April 1940, more than a year before its North American debut on the 16th of May 1941. The script was written by a few different people for Ealing Studios, who made several films with a Welsh element in this era. There are various political points to consider when recapping The Proud Valley and we'll get onto those later on. For now, let's look purely at the story and setup. Proud Valley has a disciplined runtime of 78 minutes and wastes no time throwing us into the story of David Goliath, an American sailor who deserted his ship when it ported in Cardiff. Jumping aboard a haulage train, David meets an English travelling busker, who he then joins when the train stops at the town of Blindy. I'll find a nice little street together in front of the right kind of houses. I'll pick a well-known tune and I'll murder it. And when your friends are desert you... When the two men are scolded for their terrible harmonies, David begins to sing outside the house of Dick Parry, a minor and local choir conductor. Their choir needs a bass singer, and on hearing David's tones, Dick instantly enlists him to sing with them at the next local ice ball. Hey, was that you? Yeah. And, after resistance from his wife, played by Rachel Thomas... David moves into the Parry household and secures work with Dick down the Blindy Colliery. David instantly has the respect and admiration of the Parry family, particularly young Dillis and Dick's eldest son, Emlyn, who has just recently become engaged to the shopkeeper's daughter, Gwen. Indeed, Gwen. Dad. Oh, my God. When tragedy strikes and the colliery faces closure, David sticks around to help the locals find work and honour the sacrifices of his new adopted family. What follows is a surprisingly light, yet charming and emotional story stripped back to its core. For good or bad, Proud Valley is a work which must be judged in the context of its era. We have to consider the state of the world on its release and the politics of its star. A man who has possibly become a symbol of Welsh socialist internationalism the great Paul Robeson. Proud Valley showed aspects of urban Welsh life as never seen before, albeit in a slightly tentative way. It's part of what was essentially a canon of Brit and American movies in that time which were set in Wales, with the mining communities and their struggles an absolute staple of such fare. This was an era of propaganda, 
the onset of the Second World War and the national British unity that necessitated also motivated UK studios to exploit working class stories, but while often compromising the dissident messages of their source material. I never thought I'd hear my own sons talking socialist nonsense. And Proud Valley is no exception to that. Coal in wartime is as much a part of our national defence as guns or anything else. So the original shooting script came to a far more radical conclusion, but was reshot with a resolution more sympathetic to the mine owners and capitalists. What do you think? Sir John, if they get through, it'll give the government that extra 10,000 tonnes. And I think with these men, it might be done. It can be done. Despite this, it remained Robeson's favourite out of all his films, and perhaps the only one of which he was truly proud. But for me, it has a refreshing lightness of touch in all of its politics, which allows the human qualities of David, and by association, Robeson, to shine on centre stage. From the first beat, David's black presence is not questioned by the white Welsh people. Yes, there is one script beat which touches on some local prejudice, and that's necessary and welcome, particularly as it uses humour to mock the absurdity of racism. Why, damn it, blasted man, aren't we all black down that pit? <laughs> Take a look at yourselves. For an example of what I call lightness of touch, see this scene. The miners, with David leading by example, arrive in London to put their case for reopening the pit to their bosses. Go on inside, lads. David stays back for fear of complicating the situation. But you're coming with us, Dave. No, no. I wouldn't be much help to you. There. Now this can only be a reference to his colour, but its subtlety between the lines and Robeson's comfort in his own skin is far, far more powerful than, for example, a long redemptive speech espousing personal or identity politics or a wish to expose bigotry. I will not let these stupid prejudices stop this work because I believe with all my heart that it's more important than, than guinea pigs or doctors or any of them. Proud Valley is in many ways a delightful experience but it's fair to say that it can be viewed as rather unchallenging and safe and whether that aids or impedes your enjoyment is down to personal preference. Director Penn Tennyson was forced to alter the film's ending on orders from prolific producer Michael Balcon, who had previously delivered The Citadel for MGM British Studios, because not only had the Second World War began by the time the film was released, but also because Robeson's complex and very publicly aired views about the Soviet Union caused sections of the UK press to turn against him and deny Proud Valley any publicity. Despite a positive experience working in UK theatre, Robeson was betrayed with films such as Sanders of the River, where in the edit, his character was changed from one critical of colonialism and pro-African self-determination to one supportive of continued white European rule which must have been agonising. Member of Monrovia, five months ago you made yourself chief of the Ockeries. Didn't you know that no man can be chief in the river territories without my permission? I knew, Lord. Paul Robeson and Penn Tennyson's political compromises perhaps sit at the heart of Proud Valley's appeal. Evidently, Robeson retained positive relations with Wales as a result, and perhaps was willing to accept the political concessions because they were outweighed by his character's noble and heroic black depiction, a case of seeing the bigger picture, perhaps. It was not the only Welsh mining film of the era to experience a significant depoliticisation. These films were often targeted at American audiences, so overt leanings towards socialism, even before the Cold War, were not always wise. In the case of Proud Valley, however, a more nationalistic motive seems to suggest itself in the need to present a common front against a growing Nazi threat, and Robeson's unconditional support for Stalin became even more controversial than in the wake of the Soviet-Nazi non-aggression pact of 1939. If I have one issue with Proud Valley, it's not the diluted socialism, but the exploitation of sentimental Welsh imagery for British propaganda purposes. If you allow me a tangent for a moment, it seems that when the UK is at war, or when the state needs Wales for whatever reason, our coal, our water, countryside, votes, our working class, it's then and only then that we discover an affection and fondness for 
Welsh imagery. There's a whole other video to be made about Wales in UK propaganda, but the biggest examples are probably Humphrey Jennings documentary The Silent Village and another Ealing offering, Basil Dearden's The Halfway House. Both charming films in their own right, and both presenting a noble portrayal of the Welsh, which is unfortunately absent from any of the small number of films set here during peacetime. No nation is conquered, sir, if it keeps its soul and its language as we've done. The English are our friends and our neighbours. However, even in the case of a dignified Welsh rep, cultural imperialism can still present itself across Offa's dyke. Writing for The Spectator in 1940, here's what Graham Greene had to say about the film. Of course, in 1940, things were different in terms of political correctness and geopolitics, even within the UK. It's unclear how much Robeson explored the historical and national matter of Wales itself, but he already had a relationship with our country before Proud Valley. In his autobiography, Here I Stand, he talks about discovering the internationalist nature of the labour movement in Wales, and also the similarities of the Gaman Vagani tradition of singing in relation to his own experiences as the son of a Presbyterian minister. He sang in Aberdeer and Mountain Ash to raise money for the Republicans in Spain, but this movement was characterised by anti-fascism, and despite his anti-colonial stance in relation to his own people, it's unclear, to me at least, how much he explored Wales's role as both a victim and perpetrator in that own struggle. When his US passport was taken in the wake of the McCarthy anti-communist purges, he recorded an emotional radio broadcast live to a miners' conference in Porth Corp in 1957. Hello, Paul Robson. On behalf of the South Wales miners and all the people gathered at this Ice Deadwood, I extend to you warm greetings of friendship and respect. Our people deplore the continued refusal of your government to return your passport and to deny you the right to join with us in our festival of song. My warmest greetings to the people of my beloved Wales and a special hello to the miners of South Wales at this great festival. And on visit to Wales, his son Paul Jr. confirmed Proud Valley as his favourite film. But it's interesting that out of How Green Was My Valley, The Citadel and this, that it's probably Proud Valley which contains the least amount of social criticism. At this point, it's only right to point viewers also towards Jill Craigie's Blue Scar in 1949, whose grittiness may well have been motivated by such saccharine outsider views on Welsh mining. But back to Robeson, it was the depiction of the sympathetic black man in a working class context which allowed him to compromise much of his own personal politics in order to see the story brought to screen. And it's worth remembering that this came in the wake of Gone with the Wind's perpetuation of the servile black stereotype. Finally on Robeson, there has been talk of a biopic made by Steve McQueen, who seems keen on exploring the Welsh angle. One hopes that if this project does go ahead, that it's not afraid to explore the Welsh symbolism and conflicts within Robeson's own anti-colonial struggle. I first found out about Paul Robeson through a neighbour of mine. Uh, I was living in Shepherd Bush, which is in a, in a city, but then we moved out into the suburbs. Um, the queen of the suburbs called Ealing. And one day he mailed me a pamphlet on Paul Robeson, and it was, Miners Celebrate Paul Robeson's Birthday and Anniversary. And I thought, Welsh miners celebrating this... Black American guy, who's that? <laughs> who, who, you know, and I, I had no idea. Um, and that's how that was my introduction to Paul Robeson through these Welsh miners. Director Penrose Tennyson was a one-time protege of Alfred Hitchcock and the great grandson of the famous poet, but a relatively radical figure. It was an active trade unionist that advocated for a complete nationalisation of the UK film industry. His idea for the film's title was One in Five. 
a reference to the injury rate down the pits. His directing career was unfortunately cut short when he died in a plane crash aged 39, serving in the war. In regards to the film's edit and runtime of 76 minutes, the story is lean, with no unnecessary beats. The action scenes down the pit use rear screen projection, lighting and sound expertly to create a very believable threat, and together with the art department and set design, help to make Proud Valley feel authentic in a way that, for example, How Green Was My Valley is not. It was in origin a treatment by the English actor Herbert Marshall and his wife Freda Brilliant, what a name, specifically designed for Robeson after seeing him perform on stage. Just to interject for a moment, the aforementioned Ms Brilliant appears to pretty much live up to her name, being an accomplished sculptor, writer, actor, singer and scriptwriter. Her most famous sculpture probably being this one of Mahatma Gandhi in Tavistock Park, London. Herbert Marshall found himself ousted as associate producer and story contributor and the final script was thrashed out by Penn Tennyson and the left-wing author Lewis Golding, also with ex-Welsh miner and storyteller Jack Jones, who also has a small role in the film here as Ned. We heard you say that tomorrow we may be at war. In that case, you know the risks that will have to be faced in the trenches, in the sky, on the sea, aye, and by our women and children in their homes. Jones then used his discarded story material for a revamped version of the script, which became the Radio Wales version and was in fact broadcast before the film's release. Unimaginable by today's standards. Penn Tennyson gets authentic performances from the cast. Edward Chapman's Englishness is untraceable in the Welsh choir leader Dick Parry, and I think is worth noting from a representational perspective is that Ed Chapman has clearly worked on and improved his southern Welsh accent in the couple of years between this film and The Citadel from 1939. I know, Doctor, is that, is that a bad sign? It's a long time married we are now, and it's the first baby and, and the missus. It's a warm and humorous and very Welsh character who could have been developed more in a longer movie. Well, anybody else got anything to say before me and my buddy go down the pit? Rachel Thomas, who made a career playing the Welsh mam, in works such as Blue Scar, Valley of Song, Tiger Bay, and the BBC adaptation of How Green Was My Valley, and even Under Milk Wood. Praise the Lord who made porridge. Now the Scottish actor Simon Lack's accent is not perfect, but not bad enough to be distracting. And shout outs must go to Australian actor Janet Johnson as Gwen and Dillis Thomas as her namesake Dillis Parry. The female performances sell the idea of the nuclear family and it's testament to all of them, including Dillis Davis as Mrs Owen, that they all squeeze so much character and charm into such limited screen time. Shut up, good boys, and go from here before you do frighten the children of the place out of their senses. Despite Robeson's warm and comforting presence, his character could be described as rather passive. It's unclear what purposes he serves in these domestic scenes, for example. Perhaps still in 1940, a black character inserted into such traditional white settings had to present as being totally non-threatening and sexless in order to be accepted. Saying that, the chemistry between Robeson and the Welsh cast is so touching, palpably touching on screen, particularly with young Dillis Thomas in these scenes here. We'll find somewhere for you to sleep. Hey, he can sleep on the sofa in the front room, can't he? Yes, to be sure. Yeah. Here, here. Didn't I tell you she'd be all right? Yeah. Stereotypes don't always have to be bad things. So, despite the cliché and despite pride being something I rarely feel as an individual, the warm welcome and atmosphere in these scenes does make me pretty pleased to be Welsh. Here you are, my lovely. Ah, now let us drink to the success of the male boy squire at the Ice Stadford. I think some people may take issue with the story in that it's not always David who acts as the protagonist, as if this somehow maybe takes away from his character. For me, that's not the case. We're talking about a story above all about collectivism and solidarity. It's Jack Jones' Ned who spots the danger in the mines towards the end of the film, and Emlyn who decides the group will march to London to face the mineovers. 
Yet, David Goliath is simultaneously represented as a man in total charge of his own destiny and unafraid to stand his ground. The slightly on-the-nose moniker symbolises this gentle giant trope, representing less a driving force for change than a bridge of continuity. His final sacrifice enables Emlyn to continue as the Parry's breadwinner and then marry Gwen. You're called in. No, listen to him. I said, you're called. It is the character's flight of foot and personal freedom which brings him to Wales in the first place. On that note, it's relevant that it's music and not politics which brings David to his new Welsh home. And a male voice choir, in this case, works as wonderful symbolism for his politics and the film's themes of solidarity, collective creativity and strength. David Goliath completes the Blindy Choir just as his leadership and courage down the pit elevates the collective in times of hardship. All ready, Em. Clear away, Ned. Well, here goes. Symbolism like this, I feel, is so much more powerful than on-the-nose piety, and it's a communication skill missing in a lot of modern movies and protest movements. However, it's probably fair to say that a modern story would embellish this personal drama and racial conflict in service of some more emotional heft. But the scenes down the mines are particularly tense. The editing by Ray Pitt, yes, the film was cut by a man called Pitt, is frenzied and ahead of its time, despite being a little too bright down the pits for authenticity. The rear projection effects and photography by Glenn McWilliams and Roy Colino pretty much holds up to this day, and more so than many colour films from later eras of the 20th century. It's only fair to note that not all contemporary commenters on Proud Valley flaunted their ignorance so proudly as Graham Greene. The Western Mail wrote that and the film reviewer for The Observer noted that Fair play. It's interesting that despite authenticity in many areas, there is plenty of Anglo washing pervading the film's aesthetic. There are no significant Welsh language nods, and even most of the singing is in English. Unlike, for example, How Green Was My Valley. The Halfway House. A run for your money. Or the corn is green. You get the picture. This at least is a break from a stereotype. However, the English singing includes Gasp, a translated version of Henblad Van Adai, sung by Robeson over the end credits. I'm not having a go here. Paul was a multilinguist, so I'm sure it wouldn't have been a huge stretch to get him to sing Henblad Van Adai in, you know, Cymraeg. We also have the unwelcome presence of Union Jacks displayed at vital moments. For example, when the bus takes the choir to the Eisteddfod and we see all the bunting on the Union flags and England flags as well, and crucially at the end of the film as the miners somberly emerge from the pit. At the film's finale, we see the Union Jacks again, and this symbolism very much claims the film for England and continues that kind of canonistic blurring of England, Britain and UK, which has been the bane of the Celtic nations for hundreds of years. My research tells me that a critical mass of small moments such as this in various forms of media have created a kind of a feedback loop whereby Cymru struggles to break the habit of dependency and obfuscation. I give the movie 79% score based purely on entertainment, certainly one of the most watchable films from this era, and the heart of that is the genial charm of Robeson, Chapman, Thomas 
and its lean runtime. On a personal note, when first developing the thoughts that would become this channel, there were perhaps two vital moments which pushed me to explore Welsh national representation on film and in politics. One was the discovery of the book Wales and Cinema and the fact that it was written by an Englishman, David Berry. But the other was Paul Robeson. Welshness is often painted as insular, but as someone whose perspectives were born from international travel, what I discovered by taking the plunge was a desire for Welsh internationalism. Paul Robeson seems to embody this ideal, and learning about him and this film and his connection to Wales gave me the confidence to explore my own Welsh nationalism in a way that is unequivocally inclusive and international. Like much of the Welsh media from this period, there are lessons to be learned today, and this film can elicit vital questions for and from our generations. For those sympathetic to Wales, everything it should represent, and how we move forward, Proud Valley is simply a must watch. So there you have it. Once again, thanks for coming back to the channel. Thanks for sticking with me. Hope you enjoyed this latest episode of Company Views. Subscribers, regular viewers, patrons, former patrons will know I'm finding it next to impossible to make regular Wales in the movies content at the moment due to various challenges and aspects of life and me just being, you know, generally a bit slow like. Until then, I do still have a Patreon page. If you want to check us out and check us the occasional tip, um, that's very much welcome. Until then, please subscribe, click the bell for notifications. You can follow me on all the socials. If there's any movies or issues you want me to tackle to analyze on this channel, give us a shout and I'll have a go. Until then, Diolch Varam Gwilio, thanks again for watching and I'll see you at some point in the future for the next video or episode of Comedy Views. Nice one, Hoyle Bowers.